So have any of you got any particular questions? Um, so in terms of hip, what do you do in terms of, yeah, which kind of interventions? Do you do more like replacements or uh, impingement? Or um, so I, th the majority of what I do is hip replacement. Mm -hmm. um, I don't do, if I can avoid it, revision work anymore. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm not doing enough of it to, 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 to justify it and to keep myself current with hip revision. Um, I was fairly sceptical about arthroscopic hip surgery for many, many years. Um, there were various articles over the years through the 90s where they pretty much changed the, the diagnostic label on a patient, but they didn't actually affect any change in terms of symptoms. So a patient would have hip pain, they'd call it one thing, they'd have an arthroscopy, they'd say, oh, it's not that, it's, they've got degenerative change or they've got a label tear. And they, they didn't really do much. I have subsequently, as things evolved and they got better at affecting change in the hip, I have taken up hip, arthroscopic hip surgery. I went off and was trained and do do it. And... I'm actually pleasantly surprised at the number of patients that are very happy with the results. Even when I sort of think, oh, they've got, they've got a label tear, but plus some degenerative change, um, I'm not sure they're going to do that well. Some of them do very well, just, just by sorting out the labrum. So um, I do a small, I'm not a huge hip arthroscopist. I have to have fairly clear indications to do it. I want to know that I'm going to make them better before I even think about it. It's not a diagnostic operation, it's a a therapeutic operation with a fairly small window of indications, but I will use it, yeah. Um, so, yeah, arthroscopic surgery, primary hip, revision hip, if it's straightforward, I will do, but often I will refer that on to someone else. Um, Jig does more revision hip surgery than I do, Jig Patel upstairs. Um, knee, everything, pretty much, just because, like I said, I do way more knees than I do hips. And in terms of knee, you do... Uh, replacement or yes. or? so arthroscopic surgery ligament reconstructions uh, chondral treatments of various types um, replacement revision needs as well yeah okay. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, knee for example um, uh, so you do meniscus and ACL you said no Yes. So, um, in, uh, in terms of uh, when you have a meniscus operation, because there's always like uh, fishes and consultants, sometimes they, they, they want, different, they think different things. Mm -hmm. and then, uh, because sometimes we start with lunges and the consultant says no. And so what is your vision about when a patient should start? Are you talking post surgery or, yeah, or in terms of whether, whether to, to choose an operation or non operative yeah, management? No, post surgery, yeah. Um, I think the patient should do as much as they're comfortable with. Okay. Um, I, if I've done a meniscal repair, that's yeah. a different matter. Yeah, that's what I mean in a, in a rim, for example. Okay. So a, a meniscal uh, trimming resection, they, those patients could be pushed as far as their knee will tolerate and the only limitations would be excessive swelling, yeah. pain from the patient. Meniscal repair, I do restrict their flexion for the first six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so they're normally braced. I accept that they're gonna be a little bit slower, but I want that, particularly on the, on the lateral meniscus, where we know that if you flex it beyond 80 degrees, the meniscus subluxes off the back. You look at the functional MRI studies that show that that's not a good, or, or that that happens, I want to avoid those shear force, forces so I'll restrict knee flexion for the first uh, six weeks. Thereafter, they can do what's comfortable. Um, so so it's, it's just give it a little bit of healing time before you subject the, that, the, the, the repair to shear forces. But after that, they can do what they like. Okay. Hmm. I heard some doctors saying uh, you shouldn't use your knees to climb up the stairs and uh, come down the stairs because they, they are not made for it. Is there any truth in this? Um, I think it gets difficult. If you've got patellofemoral pathology, mm -hmm. it does get difficult. Um, and it gets painful. However, we know that the stronger the muscles are, the better mm -hmm. it will get. It's 
very easy to work on the muscles around the knee, but actually the hip muscles are very important as well. And you, these guys kind of already know that. So with somebody with knee problems, actually, you, it never, you never really work on a joint in isolation. You're working on the knee, the hip, the hip abductors, the glutes. You, you kind of want that strength because your knee rotation makes a big difference to the tracking of the kneecap. And actually, your knee rotation is affected by your hip stabilizers. It's not alone there. Exactly, nothing in isolation. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm a big fan of sort of compound exercises rather than isolation exercises. Um, and maybe not at the outset, stair climbing, but I would hope to get a patient to a point where they can go up and down the stairs with at the very least holding onto a banister for support. Patients are really bad. They tell you that they're, they're pulling themselves up the stairs with their arms, not using their, their their legs, and that's difficult because if you can't, one, you have to kind of persuade them that they they shouldn't be doing that, and two, if you just say just do lots of stairs, they're they're only going to get worse. So it's it's a it's a sort of graded return to activity. But these people are talking about normal uh, people, normal knees. No problem with the knee, and they just get on a lift, and they say, no, they are not made for uh, walking up and down the stairs, which I cannot personally believe. No, I, I, I'm, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. I think the, the more, I mean, you we're, we're, we're the yeah, exactly. The more you do it, the better it will get. Yeah. Um, I'm a firm believer in keeping the, 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 mm. the, the skeleton well supported by strong muscles, mm. and if you don't do it, it'll only get worse. You know. It's a use it or lose it situation. If you do, if you don't use your muscles, they will get weaker. Um, if if you're already in end stage arthritis, it, it is difficult. But if you're halfway there, keeping the muscles strong, there's good evidence that that's going to, at the very least, improve your symptoms. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I've worked on orthopedia. A lot of my patients with knee issues or hip issues um, come in because of their you know, keen runners, not getting much time to exercise, so they go out for a quick lunchtime run. Uh, problems the day, and they, they go for an MRI, and you see certain uh, wear and tear issues. Mm -hmm. uh, what I find really difficult is knowing when to advise them that maybe they should just put a hold to a certain activity and, and change their lifestyle. Okay, uh, yeah, it is difficult, particularly if that's the only sport that they enjoy. Um, I, I do tell patients that activity modification might be part of their treatment plan. And often it's, I, I sort of give them a hierarchy of, you know, running on pavements is harder work on your knees compared to running on paths. It's harder work on your knees compared to running on a treadmill. Treadmill, you know, sort of it's cushioned, it's moving with you, you don't have that high impact force. So if they're going to continue running, a treadmill is the kindest way to run. If they can't do that, Cross trainer, you know, cross trainer is nice and smooth. You haven't got that jarring impact, so it's the jarring I think that's the issue, and and scaling back, but maintaining that running sort of activity, is is what I normally advise them just to cut back a bit. Now some of them they haven't got access to a treadmill. They want to run. They prefer, you know, some people say oh, I just I like running in the open air. Running in a gym doesn't do it for me, and then you know, good footwear. Um, and run, run past grass, try and find a park you can run in. Those, those are the things that I think are helpful. Um, ultimately, a lot of them do have to make a choice. As, you know, do they want a bit of pain in their knees um, and, and to remain active, or do they want to scale it back and try something like cycling instead? You know, much kinder to the knees, particularly yeah, patellofemoral. Is there, is there like a set stage in some degenerative changes or anywhere that you would then say, no, need to adjust um, there are some cases where I see and it's like well there are some changes but like if you as you say you might change your footwear we can maybe change your running gait slightly um, it could change but you know if it doesn't work then it reflects badly on, on myself and, and then almost failed treatment no I, I I wouldn't look at it like that and I wouldn't sell it to the patient like that it's a collaborative approach you know they they're telling you that they want to carry on running you say to them I'm going to try and help you carry on running um, and we'll work on this together, but we m I don't know how much we're going to have to scale it back. So let's try running on grass instead of on concrete. You know, let's tr and 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 scale it back. And it, it, it's it's sort of the reverse of of what I was saying about the minimum treatment required to get the patient right. 
So, so you know, why have an operation if, if physiotherapy will sort you out? It just doesn't make sense. It's not what you would want as a patient. If they're very keen to carry on with that activity, you try and work with them, but you say, I don't know how much we're going to have to adapt, but let's try cutting out certain things, reducing it bit by bit until we get to a point where your symptoms are under control, but you're doing what you want to do. And, you know, it, it's never... It's never a sort of, oh, we, this is an instant fix. I know some patients want an instant fix, but it's kind of patient education. You have to sit down with them and say, all right, let's work on this together, because it has to be collaborative, and let's try and come to a solution that keeps you happy because you're doing what you want to do, but doesn't generate lots of pain and swelling in your knees. And the, the scan is only part of it, because, I mean, one of the guys, one of the GPs that's just talked to me, he was offered a knee replacement 10 years ago. He's now playing veterans international hockey, avoided the knee replacement, carried on, probably has shocking x-rays, but he can do it. And so, it's, you know, sometimes it's about choices for the patient. Live with it, put up with it, adapt. You know, there's lots of different approaches. Um, and that's why each case must be taken on its merits and, and discussed with the patient. Yeah. Also, but they adjust. Yeah, I think it does. I think you're right. Um, it's one of the sort of paradoxes of, of, of knee uh, surgery. So you can do an arthroscopy and see a knee that's got no articular cartilage left. It's bone on bone. And yet they have very little pain. They've got pain from their fresh cartilage tear, meniscal tear. Um, but you can also see a knee with a tiny little scuff and a little bit of degeneration. They've got lots of pain. Now, whether that's because we don't fully understand the, the, the sort of the pathology of pain, whether that's because the neural responses and their, their responses to pain are different, I don't know. It's probably a combination of the two. Some people uh, feel pain more than others. And there, there was an article in the papers last week suggesting yes. it might be down to your eye colour. Yes. And there may, may be a relation. <laughs> the lighter your eyes, the less you feel pain. Yeah. People with dark eyes are... I, 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 I can't, can't work that one out. The, um, no, no. <laughs> um, but but again, you know, you've got you've got huge um, um, racial groups that you know they all have brown eyes. Um, can, can they all be as susceptible to pain? I don't quite buy that. There may be a correlation, but that's not necessarily causation. Pain threshold yeah. is always different. Yeah. Endorphins production. Well. The, Again, that's part of, I suspect, why doing exercise helps your yeah. joint pains. Um, and, you know, some of it's endorphins, some of it's keeping the muscle strong. Stability around a joint. If you've got an unstable joint and there's more m micro movement, that's going to generate more pain in a degenerate joint. Strong muscles around that will protect that and, and limit that, that excess movement that's going to cause pain. Mm -hmm. There was some articles discussing the immune response, the role of the immune response in the uh, disc. Uh, in terms of producing pain, and I think there was also some in the meniscus, right? How the immune response when there is a tear in the meniscus and how that produces pain. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't think anyone's quantified it, but there is no, no doubt that the, with with a degenerate meniscal tear, some of them you see them on an MRI scan, they've got all the right symptoms. Some of them get better on their own. Now we know from rescanning them the the disc uh, the meniscus doesn't heal but it becomes less symptomatic. And it may well be that there is a similar sort of thing that happens in the back, that there's a chemical response, an inflammatory response, if you like, that peaks and then wanes. Um, so with some of my meniscal tears that are, usually I say to patients, leave it six weeks, that are early in that, they come to me at two or three weeks, they've got a meniscal tear, they're middle-aged, they've got a bit of degenerate change as well. We know that not all of those patients will do well with surgery. I say, well, just go off for a month, have some physiotherapy, wait and see. If your symptoms become under control, we won't do anything. And, and again, it, it's, it comes back to that thing about doing the least that will make them better. As long as they're not in big trouble and, and want an operation, um, even if they want an operation, sometimes I say, well, do, let's just sit tight and see how you go. Because we know that in the over 50s, if you scan an asymptomatic population, some of them will have meniscal tears. 30% will have a meniscal tear, but have no symptoms. 
So the meniscal tear on its own doesn't equate to pain. It's 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 very hard to quantify the dynamic aspects. I suspect that some of it is is down to the actual how unstable that tear is and whether there's a flap that's getting in the way, which is why we try to ratify it by saying only those with mechanical symptoms, i.e. locking, should have surgery. But it's not quite as straightforward as that either because some of those won't really do well with surgery. There's about five or six studies comparing sham surgery to, to meniscal repair in that degenerate tear population. And in the, in the good studies, there isn't a great evidence in support of surgery. So a bit of caution is sometimes required. Watchful Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Nature's a wonderful thing. It gets lots of things better, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. Great. Well, thank, thank you. Very you nice very talking nice. to you. If you like this video, click here to subscribe or join us on Twitter or Facebook.